Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Butch I'm alcoholic. My sobriety date, September the 21st, 1989. My home group is the Three Legacies Group, and uh, I, am, I am happy to be here. I'll be happier in an hour, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Liz for that beautiful, there she is, for that beautiful talk last night. Thank you very, very much. You touched my heart and soul, dear. And uh, I'm, uh, if you, we're, we're in for a great weekend once we get through this next hour. It's all uphill from there. It, uh, I want to thank the committee for the opportunity and privilege of being here this weekend. I'm not saying that because it sounds nice or I need you to like me. I'm saying it because I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I'm a guy who considers it a privilege to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a guy who considers it a privilege to come here and be with you folks. So I want to thank you uh, for that opportunity. I saw when Jimmy asked me about telling my story here, he put the, the love for the love of AA. Huh? The love of AA. Man, oh man, oh man. You know, I, I, I just got to talk for a couple uh, minutes. Uh, I never really know what, where that's going to go, so, but somewhere. But... <laughs> But Billy took me today up to Stepping Stones, and what a beautiful experience. You, your people are blessed to have that right in your backyard, and we got to go there and sit at the table where, where Bill and Ebby sat, and to sit at the desk where Bill wrote our traditions, and man, oh man, I'm full already. I'm full. I could have just went home from there, and some of you will wish I had, but, <laughs> but I'm good to be here. I, don't, I know you don't have any selfish alcoholics in the United States. But I'm all right, we got a lot of selfish alcoholics in Canada. A lot of selfish alcoholics. And, I, and it's easy for me to come to a beautiful weekend like this, you know, like this thing just didn't happen overnight. There's been people planning this throughout the year. There were people here before you and I got here setting things up. There will be people who's, who will give up their weekends to sit at registration people who will be here at cleaning up and after you and I are gone. And it's very, very easy for me to come to an event sometimes and take that for granted and come and have a wonderful weekend and, and go home. So I want to thank the committee and the people who put this on with from the bottom of my heart. From the bottom of my heart of your service. I've always been much more impressed by what I see you do rather than what I hear you say. <laughs> I've always had the ability to sound better than I really am, <laughs> including tonight. <laughs> so it is, it is uh, good to be here. Uh, my home group, as I said, the Three Legacy Group, Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm a group guy. I believe in the home group. I believe that the home group is the heartbeat of AA. That's not podium banter. I believe that. I believe that home group should feel what it's called. That when I go into my home group on a Monday and Thursday night, I feel like I'm home. I used to say I belong to the best group in the world. I don't say that any longer. I find it arrogant of me. But I belong to a strong group, Alcoholics Anonymous. I belong to a group where all three legacies are in place. Where personal recovery is there, where we study and teach our, our 12 steps out of our basic text. But there's more. We operate in unity and under the umbrella of our, of our 12 traditions, where they're not just something that's stuck on the wall to be read once a week, but we study them and apply them as members of a group and, and group members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Belong to a group that believes in service, where it's not one or two individuals constantly doing everything, but we work together as a group to carry the message. We, we don't put on coffee and hope they come. We go get them. <laughs> we go get them. We get committees go to our detox every Monday and Thursday and bring those people from the detox to our meeting. On uh, Monday night, we have a book meeting, a tradition meeting, and, and a beginner's meeting. I don't know about you, but I go to meetings, brand new people from a detox center there, and the chairman says, join a group and get a sponsor. Like they somehow know what that means. So we have that beginner's room so they can find out what it means to get a sponsor, how we get a sponsor, what it means to be a, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I belong to a group where, where there's enthusiasm. You're going to find this hard to believe tonight, but I'm an enthusiastic guy. I love enthusiasm. I love it when I walk into my home group and that energy's in that room. That laughter's in the room. That chatter's in the room. There's a buzz in the room. It's just like being in a bar. <laughs> it's beautiful. Everybody talking, nobody listening. Nobody listening. 
Alcoholics are the most self-centered people in the world. You ever tried to talk to somebody after the meeting? Ten people walk up and say, I don't mean to interrupt. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. You come to our home group, and on Monday or Thursday night, there'll be six or eight people at that door to shake your hand when you walk in there. Because I'm a guy that believes that's one of the single most important things that we can do as a home group. That when that new guy or that new gal walk through that door for their first meeting, an in-depth version of step four doesn't mean a damn thing to them. But a warm handshake, welcome, get a cup of coffee and come in here and sit with us means a great, great deal. Great, great deal. So I believe strongly in that, uh, in that home group. I, uh, I was four years old. I was four years old and my mother's neighbor, he didn't know my ma too good, but I, he felt compelled to do this, I guess. He came to my mother's house, knocked on the door, my mom let him in. We had a little home there, they were standing in the doorway and I was sitting over here in the living room. And the guy looked at, pointed over at me and looked at my mom and said, I want you to know you're raising a juvenile delinquent. <laughs> I'm four years old, for God's sakes. This guy's called me a juvenile delinquent. Now, i got to tell you this. That guy turned out to be a prophet. <laughs> he was a prophet, that guy. <laughs> I'm 10, 11 years old. I don't know. I'm in a classroom at, at school, and the teacher announces there's going to be a walk-a-thon where you get people to pledge money, and you walk a lot of miles, and the poor people get the money. She said, I want you to come up here and get a sheet to get your pledges on. Well, I, I sat at the back of the class where the smart kids sit, and I made a conscious decision from the time I got from the back of the class to the front of the class, I'm taking two sheets. <laughs> one for the poor people, one for me. I figure if I'm walking, I'm getting some of the green. And that's how I was to go through the next 20 years of my life, lying, cheating, and stealing, some sort of sense of entitlement. But I don't have to do a hard day's work for a good day's pay. I go out in that world and take what I want. And I'm an extreme example of self-will run riot, and I haven't even started doing serious drinking yet. I'm 25 years old, and by now my wife has thrown me out of our home. And I want to tell you that I loved her as much as I was capable of loving. As much as I was capable of loving. It's important that I say that to you. And, uh, and uh, I was just, uh, you know, it's... Uh, anyway, anyway. So I'm 25 years old. My wife has thrown me out of our home by then. I'm, I'm living on the streets. I'm living in stairwells of apartment buildings in downtown Toronto. I just went from building to building. I had a new address each night. And uh, I'm out in the east end of Toronto one night and all jacked up and nowhere to go, as I said. And my wife and I owned a home what we call the beach is down near the lakefront. And we had a screened-in porch and a couple wicker couches. And I thought, I'm going to slip in there and get a couple hours and get out before she wakes up. Well, I pass out. And I wake up to one of these. And I opened my eyes and looked, and there was that little gal that I loved. And she looked at me with disgust and pity. And she said, but you're a useless piece of scum. And you're never going to change. And if you cared anything about me, you'd get up and get out of here. And please don't ever come back, because I can't stand to look at you. And I get up, and I left there. And it was a hot, hot summer day. And I'm hungover, and I'm dirty, and I'm heartsick. And I walked down to what we call the boardwalk, down on the lakefront like you are here. And I was sitting down there in a park bench in that condition. And over where Cliff and Lori were, si were sitting, there was a little boy sitting there, five or six years old, eating a popsicle. And I looked over at that little boy, and you know what I thought to myself? I wish I had a dime for a popsicle. The big shot, the dope dealer, everybody's friend, good old butch, sitting on a park bench wishing he had a dime for a popsicle. Nobody in this world wanting anything more to do with me. And here was the thought that I had that moment as clear as I'm thinking right now. I knew at that moment that that park bench or somewhere like it was where I was going to end up every single time, and I knew it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I was 25 years old. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 33. I had eight more years on those streets. And I will not bore you tonight with a horror story because I don't believe it would serve any purpose. Because if you're alcoholic like me, you already know it never gets better. It always gets worse. And I had eight more years on those streets. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 33, and I joined a group. And I got a sponsor. And I did the things you told me to do. Forget this suggested crap, the stuff you told me to do. You know where I was a number of years ago now? Huh? I was in Rome, Italy. <laughs> Rome, Italy, standing in the Sistine Chapel, looking at the paintings of Michelangelo from hundreds of years before my wife standing beside me. 
and the tears started to roll down my cheeks. And I thought of that guy sitting on the park bench wishing he had a dime for a popsicle. Long way from that park bench to the Sistine Chapel in Rome. It is a long way from where you and I came from. Many of us here tonight, the dredges of society. Many of us here tonight, our own families didn't want us any longer. Yet here we sit tonight, this weekend, members of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon, living good, rich, full, productive lives. How do we get from where we sit this weekend? How does that happen for you and I? Because it's not supposed to. But you know how it happens, don't you? It happens one way and only one way. And that is through the grace of God, through a loving God that you introduced me to through the 12 Steps Alcoholics Anonymous and a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous. You sure want to believe I'm grateful to be here and be a part of this society. I, uh, I started to drink at an early age. I hear people talk about dysfunctional families. They came from a dysfunctional family. I said to my sponsor one time, I said, Bob, you think I came from a dysfunctional family? He said, you were in it. Cruel sponsor. Huh? I don't know if I came from a dysfunctional family or not, but I'll tell you this. There was a lot of drinking in my home. Always on the weekend there was a party. And as a little boy, they'd let me play bartender. I could take them beers and take away the empties. They'd let me have swigs. They'd say, isn't he cute? And I loved that attention. So I started to drink when I was four years old. <clears throat> now, I wasn't a daily drinker when I was four. My allowance wouldn't allow it. I actively sought out alcohol, I don't know, 12 years old, 13 years old. I got a guy to go into a liquor store, get us a couple bottles of wine. I was going to be a wine connoisseur. <laughs> Two bottles of Old Sailor. I think that's comparable to what you call Thunderbird in your country. <laughs> huh? Come alive for a dollar five. <laughs> and I'll tell you, any wine I ever drank had a cap, not a cork. We drank that wine, got drunk, puked, and passed out, and that was the end of my social drinking. All downhill from there. Now, I don't know if you have this here in New Jersey or not, but I go to some meetings at home sometimes, and I hear some people in these meetings say things like this. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous hoping Alcoholics Anonymous was going to help me become a social drinker. You hear that, Don, huh? Came to Alcoholics Anonymous hoping Alcoholics Anonymous was going to help them be a social drinker. Let me tell you tonight, I didn't want to be a social drinker when I drank. I don't want to be a social drinker tonight. I don't particularly like social drinkers. I find them weird. Weird. You ever watch a social drinker? They let the ice melt in their glass. That's alcohol abuse right there. You ever drink with a social drinker? It's enough to make you puke, isn't it? You're having a few scoots. Would you like another one? Oh, no thanks. Starting to feel it. Really? I thought that's when you put it in overdrive. Social drinkers. Now, i got to tell you right now, my beautiful wife, Dee, Mari knows my beautiful wife real good. She's at home right now praying for me. Or for you. <laughs> but my wife, Dee, is a social drinker. And I'm at home a little while ago, Don. We have an open concept home in our house. And uh, Dee's in the kitchen. And she's got a bottle of wine on the counter with a funnel in it. I thought, what's she doing with that funnel? So I watched her. She took a glass of wine and started to pour it in that funnel. And I said to her, hey, what are you doing over there? <laughs> and she says to me, I put too much in the glass. <laughs> she said, I said, don't you ever do that again. I'll divorce you. <laughs> Social drinker. I'm a barroom drinker. I don't identify with closet alcoholics. Doesn't mean they're not alcoholic. Just drank differently than me. Yeah, Billy, you know those people that get the bottle, go in and lock the door, put on the country western music? I don't identify. Barroom drinker. Love them. Love it. I love bars. I like opening the door to a bar. That smoke had billowed out, the tinkle of glass, the smell of stale urine. I love it. I love it. I love it. You got many more there than we got in Canada, huh, Murray? I call them juke joints, those divey, scuzzy little rat hole joints. You got a bunch around here. I saw them. Beautiful. I like driving by them. It feels good, huh? Those divey little joints, huh? With that little sign. I like neon. I, when I was drinking, I still like neon. That's why I stay out of those casinos. They're not good for guys like me. And I got to tell you, I thank God I never tried to stop drinking in your country. I love drinking here. 
I'm going to an AA thing. No, no, I'm going to an AA thing a number of years ago in Pennsylvania. I decided to drive. My wife's coming with me. I'm driving. I'm driving down the main street of this little town, and uh, all of a sudden, I hammer on my brakes. I'm backing my car up, and my wife said to me, "Butch, what are you doing?" I said, "I got to see this again." Guys, there it was. This divey, scuzzy little joint had a neon sign said, "Stop for one, state of one." Oh. <laughs> If I'd have been drinking, I'd have had that tattooed on me. <laughs> it's an absolute work of art. Anyway, I'm not going to talk any more about my drinking than I... Can I just quickly ask, anybody here for their first conference here? Whoa, look at them all. Welcome. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm not going to talk any more about my drinking, but I quickly want to share with you what drinking does for an alcoholic of my type, and particularly the folks here that are new here tonight. And the things I'm going to share with you, I did not know this when it was happening. I saw it in inventory. I saw it as you took me back through my life and helped me see my life honestly for the very first time ever, for the very first time ever. But as I look back today, I remember being a young kid in school. I'd be in that classroom, the teacher would be at the front of the room, and she'd ask a question. And she'd start looking around that room to see if she was going to ask that question. And my head would go down like this. Oh, Jesus. Because I knew if she made eye contact with me, she's going to ask me to answer the question, and I don't want to answer the question. doesn't even matter if I know the answer to the question. I don't want to answer the question. Huh? Every decision I made in my life was based on fear, most of it unfounded and ungrounded. I'd have to go to school. When I went to school, I don't know if they still have it, book report. I'd have to get up in front of that whole class full of kids. I'd say to my mom in the morning, Ma, I'm sick. I've been puking all night. Please don't make me go. Because I want to tell you that I'd be terrified, terrified at the thought of getting up in front of that classroom full of kids. That evil thread the, 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 of our existence shot through with it. That was me. Fear dictated what I did, where I went, and how I did it. And I didn't even have a clue. Didn't even have a clue that I had it. We talk an awful lot. Uh, let's discuss resentments tonight. I prefer to call it hate. Hate. I know you're not that sick here in New Jersey, but in Canada we're hate. I'm the type of alcoholic. I'm driving my car. I'm at a red light, and I'm on the nod by now. That light would turn green, and the guy behind me lays on his horn. Whoa, I almost go through the roof of my car. I want to get out of my car, go back there, open his door, drag him out by his throat, take a crowbar, and crack his skull open. I know you nice people never thought thoughts like that, but I do. I ain't talking anger management here. <laughs> I'm talking rage. I'm talking the kind of anger that you don't have 10 minutes before and you don't have 10 minutes after. But I have an anger inside of me that comes out every now and then that I can't control. And I say things or do things to people I never wanted to say or do. And do you want to know who takes the brunt of my rage? The people who love me. It happens behind closed doors. Because you see, I'm a guy who's constantly seeking your approval. So you don't display that anger there. You keep it for the people's who approval you think you already have. Lonely. I'm standing at a subway platform in downtown Toronto on a Saturday night all jacked up, and a train pulls up, and the doors open, and a young couple my age get off that train holding hands and walk off into the night laughing and smiling. And I looked at that couple, and I felt like crying. I thought, why can't I be like those people? Why is all the trouble got to keep happening in my life time and time again? From as long as I can ever remember, I was restless, irritable, and discontented. If I was at this bar, I'd say, let's go to that bar. If I had this job, I should have that job. I had that wife, I should have that wife. Never quite right. And I'll tell you, I have a couple double vodkas, and it was just like, whew. And those sweaty hands would go away. That knot in my stomach was gone. The rage subsides. The loneliness vanishes. And at that moment, everything in my life is absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. Huh? But I'm alcoholic. I'm alcoholic. Something happens to me that doesn't happen to the non-alcoholic when I drink. See, I didn't have an absolute, I didn't have a clue that when I drank, all of that went away. And I got an immediate, an immediate, not in 28 days, an immediate sense of ease and comfort. And that's why I drink whiskey, because I like the effects it produces. But again, I'm that alcoholic, that craving start. I'd end up drinking 60 ounces of vodka. I'd smash up a car. I'd go to, out after work for a few drinks. I'd go on for a five-day bender. I don't go to work. I get fired from my job. I tell my wife I'm going out for a loaf of bread. I run into Cliff. I come home three months later. My wife's leaving. 
I'm out there drinking, partying, carrying on. I don't want to stop. I got no money, so I'm stealing yours. And now I go to jail. And what everybody focused in my life was crash cars, broken marriages, lost jobs, going to jails. We looked at drinking. We looked at drinking. We never looked at alcoholism. And people told me from the time I was 18 years old, if you just quit drinking and doing those drugs, you'd be okay. And there was the times I wasn't drinking, and guess what? I wasn't okay. As a matter of fact, I'm crazier sober than I ever was when I drank. But all those well-meaning people could see was that when I drank, the trouble that followed. So naturally, they said, stop drinking. Huh? I'd like to just talk one last thing about our drinking. We talk about our drinking stories, and we have some laughs, and we have some fun. Our book tells us, tell them some funny stories. Huh? But I don't want to leave anybody here with the idea that it was just one great big party and a big good time. Because I'm the tornado roaring through the lives of others. There were broken hearts and damaged lives because of my drinking and my actions. On September the 21st, 1989, two men came to my mother's house practicing Alcoholics Anonymous in its purest form. Now that should tell you something right there, shouldn't it? My mother's house. <laughs> somewhere every 33-year-old self-respecting alcoholic should be is with mummy. Two men came to my mother's house practicing Alcoholics Anonymous its purest form. They made the effort to leave their homes that night. They drove to my mother's house, came to my mother's house, and talked to me about their drinking. They did not talk to me about my drinking. They did not tell me I shouldn't drink, I shouldn't drug, I should go to treatment. They didn't tell me nothing. Those two men talked to me about their drinking and what had happened in their lives since they came to something called Alcoholics Anonymous. Would I like to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous with them? I was a helpless, hopeless, chronic alcoholic. I've been running the streets, drinking whiskey and sticking needles in my arm since I was 13 years old. And those two men came to my mother's house that night, took me to my first meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been with you ever since that night. I don't know what to tell you about that, but I want to tell you this. I'm extremely grateful for that experience. Very grateful. Because that's not everybody's experience that comes to Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of people come to Alcoholics Anonymous to turn to drinking and come back to AA. A lot of people come to Alcoholics Anonymous to turn to drinking many times and come back to AA. Some people come to Alcoholics Anonymous to turn to drinking and never come back to AA. But that was my experience, and I'm grateful for it. Another thing I'm very grateful for is I've loved coming to Alcoholics Anonymous Cliff from that very first meeting. That very first night, Don, I went in that meeting, Something I felt something in that meeting when I left. I didn't know what it was that night. I know what it was tonight. It was hope. I left that meeting that night with a little bit of hope. And I hope there's some new folks here th tonight and this weekend that you can leave here with some hope as well. I'm forever grateful for that. And I loved Alcoholics Anonymous. You talk about the love of Alcoholics Anonymous. Man, oh, man. From day one, I've loved it here. From day one, I've loved it. I have a deep, deep love in my heart for the old timers. Deep love. Men and women have been coming for 40 and 50 and 60 years who've made sacrifices and commitments to Alcoholics Anonymous so it'd be here for a guy like me and the new guy. I love them from the bottom of my heart. And if you are new to Alcoholics Anonymous, I would strongly urge you to get close to these men and women and learn from their experience because we won't have them with us forever. And I had some giants come into my life. None more than my own sponsor, the late. I've heard people say if you, you should never put people on pedestals. Well, you do what you need to do. But let me tell you something. I have some people on pedestals, giants in our program, a number of them right in this room this weekend. Never for a moment have I lost sight, at sight of their humanness. The greatest gift my old sponsor, my sponsor came to Alcoholics Anonymous on July the 17th, 1958. And was an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous until the day he died on June the 10th, 2004. And the greatest gift that old man ever gave me, it wasn't some, he knew, Mari knew my sponsor real good. The greatest gift that old man ever gave me, it wasn't some profound thing he pulled out of the book, some divine spiritual wisdom he laid on me. <laughs> the greatest gift that old man ever gave me was he allowed me to see his warts. He allowed me to see him get afraid. He allowed me to see him get angry. Allowed me to see him get selfish. Allowed me to see him get lustful. Allowed me to see all of him. Because if he hadn't, and you don't continue to, I'll never measure up. We are much more brothers and sisters in our defects than we are in our virtues, aren't we? <laughs> 
and I had some wonderful people come into my, my life. I'm the, I, 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 I'm the believer in strong sponsorship, and I believe that without strong sponsorship, our chances of recovery are very, very limited. And so you started to take me through this process and help me have a look at this stuff. Incredible thing, incredible thing. Uh, you see, I don't know about any of you, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't have a clue what my problem was. Maybe you did, but I didn't have a clue. Now, I'd been told what my problem was. As a matter of fact, I'd been told quite a bit what my problem was. My parents had told me what my problem was. I had uh, two or three wives tell me what my problem was. <laughs> a couple of judges had told me and two or three psychiatrists. I'd heard my whole life, which just quit drinking, you'll be okay. You were the first people that said to me, kid, drinking's not your problem. It's your solution. How I feel when I'm sober is my problem. You see, sober, I'm prone to misery and depression. Sober, I can't seem to control my emotional natures. Sober, I can't form true relationships with others. Sober, I'm, I can't seem to make a living or be of real use. Sober, I'm full of fear and unhappy. Huh? That's how I am sober. And that, my friends, is a spiritual malady. And an alcoholic of my type not drinking and not treating that malady and sitting in AA meetings does not treat that malady. The meetings are where the fellowship is. The meetings are where the, the solution is. The 12 Steps Alcoholics Anonymous treat that malady. And an alcoholic of my type not drinking and not treating that sober, I will get so uncomfortable that eventually I have to do one of two things. I don't have a choice. I've lost the power in choice. That's the difference between me and the guy that goes out and gets drunk every weekend and goes to work on Monday morning, is described in our book as a hard drinker. But I am an alcoholic. I've lost the power of choice. And so I'll get so uncomfortable I either have to drink again or blow my brains out. Did you hear that ringing? I'm just checking. A lot of acid. A lot of acid. Huh? <clears throat> Most of us drink again. But we all know somebody who's paid the supreme price, don't we? Huh? Didn't have a clue. Selfishness and self-centeredness, that you told me was the root of my troubles. The root. There was a lot of obvious troubles in my life, but underlying all of that, selfishness and self-centeredness. And you told me above everything, above everything, I must be rid of it or else it kill me. And there seems no way of getting rid of it without God's help. And that, you told me, is the purpose of our 12 steps in our program. Through some actions that I take and some principles I try to live by, I can get connected to a power that would solve my problem. I thank God for that sponsorship. I thank God that they helped me understand. You took me through. I'm not going to do this. We're going to hear about it all week from some wonderful people. But that inventory, I go to meetings sometimes, and they're on that fourth step, and you'd think it's some sort of a confessional step. Huh? Some sort of a confessional. You taught me it was a fact-finding mission. Fact-finding. You see, I don't deal in facts. I deal in delusion. I, at different times, cannot differentiate the truth from the false, drunk or sober. And you told me that inventory was a fact-finding process because self is what's killing me. And that, you wanted me to see how self manifests in my life in many different ways and blocks me from that power. Fact-finding mission. And you took me through that. You, you took me through the rest of the things. You took me through um, restitution. You will, you will talk, I think Don's talking about, about that. You know, incredible gift for me, that amends process. Very freeing for a guy who'd been wrapped in self his entire life. I don't know about any of you, but I'm going to tell you for me, my entire life before coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, for a long time in Alcoholics Anonymous, and today if I'm not in fit spiritual condition, the first thing I did with every person I ever met, I immediately sized myself up. I do it without even knowing I'm doing it. It's as natural to me as breathing. And every single time, every single time, I was either less than or better than. But not one single time was I ever the same as. And because of this process, because of inventory, because of amends, because of all this, today I can just be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, no better than and no less than. Today I can just be one of God's kids, same as you. That is a freeing experience for a guy who'd been wrapped in self his entire life. Incredible. And then the great thing is, is you introduce me to a loving God. 
When I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was not a disbeliever. If you'd have asked me, do you believe in God when I came here, I would have said to you, yes, I do. It had as much meaning in my life as the price of coffee beans in Brazil tonight, but I wasn't a disbeliever. Huh? And if you'd have asked me about God, I would have said to you, God's way up in heaven. And he's got long hair and a big beard and a big stick. Charlton Heston. <laughs> For you younger people, that was an actor. <laughs> and if you were good, good things happen. And if you were bad, bad things happen. Huh? Chuck Chamberlain used to say that we have one problem and only one problem. That's all we got, you and I, is one problem. From that one problem come a lot of other problems, but we just have that. And that one problem was a conscious separation from God. A conscious separation from God. Well, if God's way up there and I'm down here, have you ever heard more of a conscious separation in your life? You were the first people who said to me, no, kid, no, no. Deep down inside of every man, woman, and child is the fundamental of God. And in the final analysis, it's only there that he can be found. And the central fact of my life, the great reality is my creator has entered my heart and lives in a way that is indeed miraculous. You introduce me to that God. I will be for eternally grateful for that. Don't you love our book? That's sort of a stupid thing to say here, isn't it? Of course you love our book. But don't you love it? Uh -huh. I believe that our book is a spiritual vortex. What's he talking about now? Uh, a spiritual vortex. I've, I believe it doesn't matter how long I'm sober. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how many guys. I, none of that. I can open that book at a given time and read a couple of paragraphs, and I will see that in a way that I have never seen it before. Huh? There is no end to spirit. It is endless. It is endless. And I love Bill's writing. I love where Bill says that we will suddenly we will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. Huh? I know many of you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, I pray, God, you stay here till you do. But you know that time? You know that moment where you hear something or you read something? Huh? And you fill up and you know. You know. You know, I come to be with you many times, uh, weekends and stuff like this. And uh, I get up early in the morning. Uh, I like to come to be a part of the conference. And I get all my gear together. And uh, I'm coming. I'm, I'm 45 minutes from the airport. And I get my car and I start to drive down that highway. I start to drive down that highway. And it's a beautiful sunny morning. And I'm coming to be with you. And I stick a little Leonard Skinner in. <laughs> a little simple man. A little free bird. And I drive down that road, and I think of everything that you've done for me. I think of the life that I've had because of you, everything that you have done for my family. And I drive down that road, Don, and I'm telling you the tears are pouring down my face. And for a brief moment, for a brief moment, I am conscious of the presence of God. I am conscious of the presence of God. I felt that today at Stepping Stones. And I go from believing to knowing. And there's a big difference between believing and knowing. And then we are connected to that power. And it is an incredible thing in my life, that power of God. And you did that. And the great paradox, Alcoholics Anonymous, that if I want to keep all this, i got to give it away. That nothing, nothing ensures us immunity from drinking, like intensive, intensive work with other alcoholics. When all else fails, this works. The occasional good deed is not enough. My very life as an ex-problem drinker depends upon my constant, my constant thought of others. Unless I continue to enlarge and perfect on my spiritual life through unselfish acts and helping others, I will surely drink when we hit those certain low spots. If there's anybody here tonight who's been here a year or two and everything in your life is going absolutely wonderful, buckle up. <laughs> Buckle up, because life will happen. Life will happen. And when it does, I better be connected to a power, huh? connected to that power. You know, everything that is good in my life is because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I know we got some new folks in that with us tonight. And we come and we tell our stories, and we want to bring a message of hope. We want to bring a message of hope. 
but we're not here. We don't want you to think that we come here and do 12 steps and then float off into Wonderland. Huh? Life still goes on. Life still goes on. A number of years ago, our, our seven-year-old granddaughter was diagnosed with leukemia. And she had to go to Children's Hospital for five months and have chemotherapy and a spinal tap once a week. That little girl never complained one single time. Not one single time. And uh, after five months, the cancer went away and Sarah came home. And about three months later, the cancer came back. And they said she has to come back to sick kids and she's going to get the strongest chemo we have and the strongest radiation that we have. And she has to have a bone marrow transplant. And she has a 30% chance. She spent that time going through all of that. We didn't have a, uh, a match um, for it. We didn't have a match for it. And so our son-in-law had a vasectomy. He had that reversed that hopefully our daughter could get pregnant and the baby be a match, because the family members a 25% chance of being a match. Nobody else in the family was. Odds would be good. Leah got pregnant and had that baby, and, uh, and uh, it wasn't a match. The baby wasn't a match. So they said, we're going to do a stem cell transplant. It's something newer that they're doing now. But it meant Sarah was going to be in isolation for four months and very, very sick. It wipes everything out of you. They did that stem cell transplant, and the, and the doctors couldn't believe what they saw. They had never given a stem cell transplant with someone who'd just given birth. Now, I don't understand this, but something about giving the birth did something to that stem cell, and it worked miraculous. They were talking to children's kids all over North America, sick kids and St. Jude's and all those places. And Sarah wasn't in isolation four months. She was there four weeks and wasn't even sick and came home. The cancer was gone. And four months later, the cancer came back again. And they said, there's no more treatment. You take your daughter home, and she has six months left. You make the best of it. And Sarah felt good in those months. Our granddaughter did a lot. Our granddaughter met Justin Bieber. Yeah. Our granddaughter heard Katy Perry. Our granddaughter drove a real race car. <laughs> and in October, the Toronto Zoo... The Toronto Zoo brought reindeer, real reindeer, to the house in a Santa Claus because she wasn't going to be here for Christmas, and she was there with those real reindeer. And eight years ago, yesterday, we buried our seven-year-old granddaughter. She'd have been 15 now. Somebody said to me, but you talk an awful lot about that God in these meetings. If there's a God, how did he let that happen to that little seven-year-old girl? That little girl never did anything to anybody. Why would he let that happen? And I said, God had absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing to do with Sarah passing. But the moment she passed, God had everything to do with that. It talks in our book about we will, we will lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. I have no idea what it looks like. I cannot define or comprehend it. But I believe that Sarah is in a place that is so beautiful, so incredible, you and I can't even imagine it. And maybe if there's somebody that's been ripped out of your life, I suggest that they're maybe right there with her. Huh? Right there with her. One last story. One last story. I, uh, it talks in our book, make sure our relationship with him is right in great events. Great events will come to pass for you and countless others. Huh? Oh. We've experienced that, haven't we? We experienced that this weekend. Great events, right here. For the love of AA, right here, right here. I went to a conference a number of years ago in Kelowna, British Columbia. And uh, I went there. It was a little roundup, a couple hundred people. And I, was ta I talked there on Saturday night, and they were doing the countdown, Billy. And, but the room is a hall, and it was a little darker there. But I like, if, I like being up there on Saturday when they do the countdown, because you can watch it all rather than trying to do this. I get a sore neck. But anyway, they did that countdown. They got all the way down to one day, and I couldn't clearly see, but I knew it was a young gal at the back of the hall stood up for one day, and the place went crazy. They lost their minds, and it was beautiful. And so... The program was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On Sunday at the program, said Joe that there was going to be a breakfast and then a closing speaker. I had a morning flight out, and uh, I knew I couldn't catch all the speaker, but I thought we could go for the breakfast, maybe catch a bit of it. 
So when we went there, I got a table near the door so we wouldn't interrupt the meeting while the meeting was going on when we had to leave. And we're sitting there, and the breakfast was just some tables with some bagels and fruit. I'm sitting there, and a young gal comes walking in with two little, little kids, children, in her hands. And when you looked at this girl, you knew she was new. And you could look and see that she had nothing. You could tell the way these kids and stuff were, were dressed. And it just ripped at my heart. Anyway, she came in and sat the kids down. She came walking over to me. She said, are you Butch? I said, yes, I am. She said, you talked to her last night. I said, yes, I did. She said, I'm the girl that got the book for the one day last night. I said, well, congratulations. And I encouraged her to get a sponsor in a group. And, and she, she wanted to thank me. Some things I'd said maybe helped her. Anyway, she sat the kids down and she went to get them some fruit. And, and the thought came to my mind, this might be the only meal those kids eat today. And it just tore at my heart. And I thought to myself, May, I'd like to help if I could. Maybe I give her, give her some, some money maybe to help her out a bit. But I'm him and Han, some old geezer giving the young gal money in the meeting. <laughs> Still concerned at what you think of me, for God's sake. Incredible. Incredible. Anyway, I was going to, and just then the chairman started the meeting. And I thought maybe I wasn't supposed to do it. And, and we're there a few minutes into that, and, uh, and then I had to go. I gave my guy the nudge. Well, just then, the young gal gets up and goes out in the hall. I thought, maybe this is my opportunity. So I said to the guy, go ahead, I'll be right with you. And I go out, and she's just coming in and stopped, and she thanked. And I put a $100 bill in her hand, and she saw it, and she started to sob. And she said, you have no idea how much this will mean, not for her, she said, for my children. She said, I don't know how I could ever pay you back. I said, you don't need to, but you stay here with us and do what we do, and maybe one day you can do the same thing for another girl. And I come home. I come home. Now, uh, at that time, um, I'm not very technical still. Somebody said to me today, I had to get a charger, and they said, did you have an iPhone? I said, I don't know. I don't know. An iPhone. I, 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 I just gave up my BlackBerry last year. I did. It was traumatic. I bought four of them, Billy. Four. I had four, and I, you know, I, had to, I they ran out. No more. I was bad. So I, 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 I didn't even know how to email then. My wife, Dee, would check my emails for me. <laughs> I don't have anything to hide anymore. It's beautiful. And uh, so anyway, I'm home for a few days, and, uh, and Dee says to me, there's an email here for you. And uh, she said, I think you want to see this. And I go, and it's the gal. And she thanked me in that. She said, I'm looking around to get an apartment that I hope I can get for me and my children. And she said, I'm going to try and go back to school, and I would like to be a nurse one day And that. It was a nice thing. Sometime later, Dee says to me, there's an email here for you I think you should see. I go, I see it, and it's an email from, from the young gal. And she said, I just wanted you to know, Butch, I wanted to thank you for what you did and help my, my children. And she said, uh, I just wanted you to know I have an apartment and uh, my children are with me and I'm, and I'm going, I'm back in school and on Tuesday I'm going to get my one year medallion. Great events will come to pass. Just before COVID a little ways or a while ago, and more than that even, uh, I was there with Don. I got a call. Can you come to Kelowna, British Columbia for a conference? I said, uh, the date was empty. Yes, I can. So I, I go out there. And before I go, Dee says to me, do you think that young gal will be there? I said, well, probably a 90% chance. No. That's the nature of our illness. This thing is cunning, baffling, and powerful. I said, but you never know. Maybe. So I get out there to that conference and that, and we're in the hall, I was there that night, and a gal come walking up to me. She said, are you Butch? I said, yes, I am. She said, uh, you, you talked at this uh, meeting nine years ago, this conference nine years ago. I said, well, I was saying to the guys it was a while ago. I didn't know. She said, nine years. I said, nine years it is. Now I remember. <laughs> She said, you were here nine years ago and you spoke at this roundup. I said, yes, I did. She said, when you talked, there was a gal there for her first meeting. I said, yes, there was. She said, and you gave that girl $100 to help her children. I said, yes, I did. She said, well, I want you to know I'm her sponsor. 
And she's sober nine years. And she said she saw a flyer with your name on it, but she just had some surgery and couldn't come here. And she made me come from Calgary to here to hug you and thank you. Huh? I got home. I got home from that conference, Billy, and about a week later, there was a, a letter for me from Calgary. I thought, I don't know who this is. And I opened that uh, letter up, and uh, there was a nice note to me and a picture of her and her two children at graduation, and a nice note. And then there was a folded piece of paper. Huh. And I opened the paper, and there was a $100 bill <laughs> with a note that said, Butch, I would never do anything to offend you, but I wanted to send you this $100 that maybe one day you can pass it on to another young gal like you did me. Huh? Make sure that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. Everything in my life that is good, anything that I am or ever hope to be, is because of Alcoholics Anonymous, because of men and women in rooms like this. If I lived to be a thousand years old, Jimmy, I could never pay you back. I could never pay you back. And you want to know this kicker to this thing? You've never asked me to. You've merely suggested to me, although at times strongly, <laughs> that I try to give a little bit back of what's so freely been given to me. Take a new guy to a couple meetings. Show him a little love and kindness and maybe give him a hug and tell him he's going to be okay. I don't know how you feel about that, but it seems like a terribly small price for everything you've given me. Huh? Everything you've given me. You know, I don't know what's going to happen from here on in, and none of us do. Huh? None of us know for sure. Just because we get sober, become members of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon, life doesn't stop happening. People die, relationships end, businesses fail, people get sick, life goes on. But I'll tell you, every single morning, every single morning for many years, first thing this morning and again tomorrow morning, I say to that loving God that you've introduced me to, I say, if you see fit, I sure would appreciate it if you keep me in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because my dear friends, there is no place in this world I'd rather be than right here with you fine, fine people. Thank you and God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.